welcome to Dying in Grace. My name is Arlene Steputat and I'm your host for this program whose mission is to really talk about all aspects of end of life, living well, and understanding death in a way that we can reintegrate it, make friends with it, and understand that death is part of the life cycle. Each week I bring a an individual from our community who has a unique perspective, background, or experience to share their knowledge and uh, insight into what we can all learn about the dying, dying and death experience. And this week, I'm happy to uh, have Chaplain Jerry Gray, one of my friends from the community, yes. uh, who is the um, director of Chaplain 24-7. So thank you so much, Jerry, for coming. Well, what a, what a pleasure. I didn't realize when I first met you years ago that I'd be sitting across from you doing an interview, but thank you so much for inviting me. Me neither, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I'm so glad. Uh, so tell me first um, a little bit about what Chaplain 24-7 is. You well, Chap Chaplain 24-7, I came out of, I don't want to say a need, but it, it was a, an idea to bring all the chaplains with in Santa Barbara County together in, in training uh, relationships. Um, so that's where, how it kind of started. Uh, so now we, we do we drew training together. Uh, Chaplain 24-7 is also there for first responders. We have a website, uh, we, we have a Facebook page. So we put things that are pertinent to, to, to help uh, the first responders and the chaplains within our, within our county. So, uh, how long have you been involved with the, you, it sounds like you were a founding member of it. Yeah, I, I started the organization um, back six years ago, but I was a chaplain, have been a chaplain for 15 years. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, uh, are you a local here in Santa Barbara? Did yeah. you grow up here? Born and raised. Born and raised, yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, and so, how did you yourself come to the chaplaincy? That was quite a journey, and uh, I think the Lord probably planned that quite a while ago, the things, my, my job, my occupation, dealing with people, talking to people, listening to people, um, and then getting involved in, in our, on our church with uh, ministries and elders and things, and dealing with people, and quite often it's people that have hurts. And so it's, it's, it's not a matter of, let's make Jerry a chaplain, it's what's Jerry doing? And this happens with, with all, the, all chaplains, is what are they doing? And if it fits that, that, that mold, then, then, it's, then it's a go. So uh, apparently the doors, that, my prayer was to make the doors open or closed to becoming a chaplain and, and again 15 years later. In fact, it was 15 years um, yesterday it was my kind of anniversary of 15 years of being a chaplain. Well, what a wonderful way to yeah. celebrate your anniversary by helping the community understand this resource yeah. And, yeah. and what you all do. So, um, so the one thing I, I noticed on your card is, is it says a ministry of presence. So for people that don't quite understand what that means, could you, what's your view of being present for someone? The ministry of presence, as it says, is, is being there. And, and the key is, is knowing when you're there, you know, what to do, what to say, what not to say. And that comes with training. Anybody, you don't have to be a chaplain to do ministry of presence. When somebody has a loss, sometimes just being there alongside of them, knowing when to say something, when not to say something, silence is also good. And this, it's a unique dynamic where they might not remember my words that I say when I do these calls, but they do remember that I was there. And it brings a calm, it brings a peace, um, and hopefully we can give them hope. So it sounds like it has a lot to do with the way someone shows up on the scene um, and deals with, with people. So, so tell me, um, what are, you're primarily called out 24-7 for um, tragic events or emergency events in the community. Can, can you explain a little bit more about when Chaplain 24-7 is called? Yeah, well the, the chaplaincy is, is really there for the first responders. That's our number one priority. Uh -huh. uh, but it's when the first responders say, you know what, all my resources, you know, all the ladders, all the water, all the things that I have in my truck or law enforcement can't, can't help this situation, which is emotional situation of usually family members, uh, which are also victims, 
of, of the grief of, of the loss. So that's when they pick up the phone or they'll call dispatch, dispatch will call us and request a, ch a chaplain. So that's the dynamics of that. Going into it, it's always kind of fluid. Uh, many times I get asked, you know, what are you gonna say, what do you say? And I go, I don't know. I mean, I know what to say, but it, it's almost like a dance. You, you're in and out of, of, of the relationship. Like if there's a, a young, we, I did have one number of years ago where it was a, a death of a, of a young man um, and they were gonna, it was a death notification, which is handled differently. And I said, you know what, why don't, why don't we do this? Why don't I stay out by the vehicle, you go in and do the death notification. That's, that's what the sheriff's, the coroner's office did. Right, so where they're telling a family member your loved one has passed. Correct. So this is their first finding out that someone they love has passed. Exactly. And say, offer my services. Tell them the chaplain is here if you'd like to see him. And if, because many times they're very, they're angry. They're, they're, I mean, they're in shock. Right. Many times they're very angry. And to see somebody that, that represents God, because that's what a chaplain does, crosses, because I'm a Christian, um, and that could actually escalate things. So we try, we, another saying, again, ministry of presence, but another thing is do no harm. Mm -hmm. But the normal situation is we get a call because there's a, there's a passing. They've already asked, would you like a chaplain? And they would say, I would like to see a chaplain. So we come out, I, I usually meet with the first responder, be it fire or law enforcement. They kind of give me a rundown of, of what happened. And then they introduce me to the family members. And I will ask them, would you mind if I spend some time with you? And I, don't, I can't remember any time they've said no. And then it kind of goes from there because many times family members will, will come and then the dynamics will go up and down. And so you just have to be kind of, um, again, it's like a dance. You need to pull back and let family members meet and gather and then when to come in and comfort and pray and things of that sort. So I, first off, thank you for that, for our community. And I think uh, it's probably a great relief for first responders as well. I mean, they have their hands full with putting out the fire or attending to mm -hmm. the, ac the scene of the accident or the scene of the crime. And that's a unique skill set to be able to be of comfort. It's not to say our first responders don't have that capability, but they've got to have you have that as a singular focus must take a an edge off for them. That's, it, let, it gives them, gives them some, some relief too. And as you said, it's to serve them as well. Um, is there a, an average length of time that you stay with a family? I mean, when, when you're on call with this dance, are, is an average you're there for an hour? Could it go on for several? I'm sure there's exceptions, but what's your, if such a thing, a typical or an average length of time that you spend with a, a family? Yeah, you know, I, I couldn't give you, I couldn't give you a time, but sometimes it, it's, it's very brief. You know, we, we were on the scene and maybe family members are coming. The, the best comfort is family members. Sure. Um, and so family members or friends are coming and then you can just see that they're taken care of. It's kind of like first aid for us. Uh, and if they're in a good, safe spot and they have that comfort, then we just kind of exit. We leave them our card. So if you want to get in touch with us, that's fine. But there are times where we had the, uh, a drowning up at, at uh, Kachima Lake a few years ago. And so we responded out and I was there for um, three days. I would go up, spend time with the families because- Oh, when they were searching for the little boy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I spent uh, time with the families for for three days until he was he was recovered, um, I have I have one going on right now. There was a very sad situation, a death off of a cliff, just um, yesterday Sunday, mm. and I've been the, the family members which are out of time are in touch with me today and tomorrow. We're going to meet and and go to the beach and and help them kind of process you know what happened. So sometimes it's very short and other times it's, it's prolonged. Many times we'll, we'll build up a relationship um, with the family members and they'll have us do the, the funeral or the memorial. And I've had some very good blessed times with, with family members to carry them from initial call out to the, the, the final prayer you know, at the graveside. It's very special. Well, yeah, because you are the first comforter. I, I, I mean, at some level when you come out, if somebody, particularly if they're of a particular faith or, you know, um, 
it seems to me you're the first one whose sole purpose is there is, I loved what you said about emotional first aid. Like that, the, they, the cops or the firefighters or whoever can do the binding of the physical wounds and that, right. but you're, you're there to help with the emotional first yeah. aid. Yeah, it's, it's important for the first responders because they see a, a lot, a lot more than, than, than I'm called in to see. And they really need to be detached from that emotional part as best as possible because they have a you know, 20, 30 year career. And to see that is very difficult. As a chaplain, we're, we're called to engage. Right. And, and give the empathy and the sympathy. And, it, and, and that's, that's a supernatural thing to be able to do that you know, year after year after year. But that's our calling. That's what we're, we're called to do. And so, so when we, we drive away, we feel very, I mean, I personally, I feel very blessed that I was able to help somebody in, in truly maybe the darkest uh, time of their lives. Yes, I, I mean, I can resonate with that having done my own bedside sitting with families and yeah. in the hospice work. Sure. It, it, it is a unique calling. And I wonder um, what you as a group do to help yourselves um, balance out taking that in all the time. I mean, all that giving, and sometimes I mean, you're 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 taking in a lot of emotional pain. So, what do you all do uh, for yourselves? Do you get together to debrief? Do you, how, how do you support one another to be able to s sustain this work? Right. Well, the bottom one for each individual, I, I think, is the person that's closest to them which is my wife. Uh -huh. I mean, without the support of my wife, getting the call at 2.30 in the morning and she's waking up and she's like, how can I help you? Well, we obviously say a prayer before I go out. So if you have a spouse or a close relative that you might live with, but we've had those sort of situations to support that. Further than that though, we do get together once a, once a quarter with the Sheriff's Department, we do training. And during the training, we have called reflections. And during that time, we go through and, and each one of us kind of um, go through the calls that we've had since the last time. And that's kind of our, our download of mm -hmm. that. I have a great supporting church, Calvary Chapel, so uh, Santa Barbara. Um, I'm on staff there. And so with that, we have a number of chaplains. And so that's a great support. So it's layers of support to keep us, um, so we're in, in a frame of mind where we can go out and do what we're called to do. But it is important for us self-help because you, if you don't watch yourself, you, you can find yourself not in a good place. Well, the whole idea of um, compassion fatigue yes. for any people are in the field, um, whether it's nurses in the hospital, mm -hmm. I mean, that is just, uh, and that, that's um, something that needs to be addressed. And I think those, those of us who are called to be of service, we're really used to the giving part. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, and the, the flow back is not always so easy. Asking for help, if you're the helper, it's hard to admit you need some help back. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I shouldn't say absolutely for sure, but yes, it, it, it is because it, it's, it go, kind of goes against the flow. I, I'm here for you, I, you know, I'm here for you. Right, but later on I, I need somebody to be there for me and I hear your, yeah. the importance of family and, and also other colleagues, it sounds absolutely. like, that you do that. Um, and, and so I wonder too, is a part of your chaplaincy to support the processing for the first responders who may see horrific things. Do you ever do sessions? I know you're doing training sessions, but do you ever do reflection, debriefing, or support them when they've maybe seen something that was just too hard to deal with? I'm, I'm thinking certainly of the whole debris mess and what the toll that took on everyone. Yeah. Um, how was how did that impact you? Because that was a long haul there, and it's not over. No, no, it, it's not. It's um, that one was an uh, interesting one. I was um, after the debris flow. I worked the with Montecito Fire and their auxiliary, so I worked the Thomas Fire, and I'm not saying it came from the fire because we all had a lot of ash. But I came down. With, I didn't know it at the time, but I came down with valley fever. And you we, did? Yes, and oh. I just thought it was, the doctor thought it was bronchial, so I was under treatment for that. Then we had the flow, and so I only worked the first three days. And then I was admitted in the hospital for seven days with, with pneumonia for valley fever. But during those, those, those first three days, I worked with the coroner's unit for the families that, that couldn't 
um, find their loved ones, yeah. they would come to that, that center, uh, First Pres Presbyterian Church. And so that's where I worked with, with the, the first, res not the, well, I did first responders because I went to the coroner's unit where they were, they were um, trying to um, uh, identify. But the bigger picture of what you're talking about, and this is a truly a, a God thing, is, is that three years before that, we started an organization uh, that's actually under the Santa Barbara Police Association for, just for first responders that, that, that have some issues that they want to kind of deal with, being aside from departmental. So it's, you know, their supervisors don't know about it, things of that sort. It's called at ease. And it's all confidential. It's all confidential, and we have we have uh, we have uh, counselors for them, uh, free of charge, and their families can go to it. We have obviously chaplains a, a part of that. We have a number of other therapies that they can tie into. So when the debris, debris flow happened, which was really um, we we had something in place mm -hmm. for the first responders, and they've they've really utilized it. So that was really that. And it continues. So how wonderful that it was already in place. It yes. was something they knew, not something that you had to try to create amidst yes. everything else. It was already there as a resource. Yeah. That, that's so. With all this work that you've done and facing death every time you get a call, for sure. How has that changed you and your view of death and dying, or has it changed? Well, it just reaffirms that we have no control. And um, for me, it's, it's, it's a matter of looking at, at a different perspective of life. And there's things that, that, that you can say like, well, that was their time. Or, uh, you know, there's a number of things that people could say that you don't say in front of the, the, the family. You let the family say that if they say, well, it was their time. Um, but my perspective is, is eternal. And there's, there's a reason for everything. Right now, certainly can question it. But I think when I get to the other side, I won't even question it. I'll understand it. Mm -hmm. And I find great comfort in that. Mm -hmm. So you talked about um, some of the things to say and some of the things not to say. And I, I personally think that our culture doesn't really know how to deal with grief at all, for the most part, that we're uncomfortable with other people's pain and we want to fix it or stop it or do something because being present as you are to someone's pain uh, is something we don't teach people to do and it, it, we just don't have, we haven't yet shown people the good way to support someone in a shocking moment or a horrific moment. Do you have some tips for our listeners of, you know, some things to do or don't? I know, I know you can't train them in, in a way, but what are some yeah. of the things that, you know, someone finds out that their neighbor just suddenly lost a child? Mm -hmm. what, what is an act of comfort that they could do, or is there something they could say or not say? I mean, I... I know I've heard people who are in grief say, let me give you the laundry list of stuff I've heard that really has not helped me. Right. So do you have any tips for someone who's a lay person who wants to be of support in a, in a moment of unexpected death but doesn't know what to do? Yeah. Um, a hug is good. A hug is good. And you can say, I I'm here for you. But if you say it, you need to be there for them. Um, just, you know, if, so often when they first lose a child or, or anybody, uh, family members, friends, it's, it's all right there and they're many times over, over, overwhelmed. Um, it's good, but it's, it's, it's overwhelming and they get through the process of, of the, the memorial, the, 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 the funeral, but it's, it's the week, it's the months after that when everybody else is gone. That's when I think friends and neighbors just come alongside come, you know, and maybe leave them something and just let them know that their son has not been forgotten. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the use of, it's, you don't want the, them to feel like their, their lost one is, is forgotten. It's important. Mm -hmm. So how do you cope with 
uh, when the phone rings, you have no idea. Like, you have no idea what you're being sent to. How do you deal with that unknown? And, and when the phone rings, does your system just kind of click into gear? Or walk us through that process a little bit. Yeah, that's interesting because like you, you get a two o'clock call and you, you wake up and, and, you, and you see it and you just, you know, you, there's a time factor because you know every minute that you're not there, somebody's still, you know, they're grieving. And so you, you hurry, you get, you get ready to go. And I don't think a whole lot about it. Many times they don't have a whole lot of information to give me. So I'm just praying. I'm just praying, you know, for the right words at the right time. And, um, and they just, it just flows. I think it's like any professional that when you're in the, in, in the mode, it just, it just happens. And it's afterwards, that's when um, it hits me. Or it's the next morning where it really, when it hits me about what's the family thinking about um, as they wake up or did they get any sleep? That's when the, the effect of the call actually hits me. But to answer your question, um, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's, I've been 15 years of, of doing this. I don't really, I wish I had a good answer for you, mm -hmm. but it's just, you just do it. So when the phone rings, do you have a sense of dread at all or just? You know, dread, if I'm driving and I know that it's a death notification for, for a young adult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I have to be honest with you. I go, why am I doing this? Right. Why am I putting myself through this? But when I, when I leave, I know why I did it and I know why I'll continue to do it. Right. So the reward. So what, what is it that, what's the gift for you in being in the service? Like, you know, you know why, what can you put it into words a little bit for us? Well, you know, we've already talked about the aspect of it's easier to give and, mm -hmm. and things of that sort. And I, I'm a firm believer that, that you're, you're, you're blessed more by giving than, than receiving. And it's not about me receiving by any means, but to be at a, at a point in time in somebody's life that's pivotal, pivotal. And to be able to help them, comfort them, hold them, pray for them and and then and then and leave that you know that you did God's work mm -hmm. I mean that's what what's a higher calling than that mm -hmm. truly yeah so um, how many chaplains in chaplain 24 7 because clearly I know you're willing to do a lot but you're not available 24 right. 7 like there might be a call right now and you can't leave so, I couldn't leave, yeah. so how many chaplains do you have in the organization we have two up in North County, uh, and we have uh, two here. We have an Orthodox, and then um, myself, and then Bill Gates, which is down in Carpinteria. But that's that's kind of the organizational thing. I mean, the the, the main call out is is from you know dispatch from city dispatch, county dispatch. Those are the ones that call out uh, for the um, for the uh, to assist the first responders. The chaplain twenty four seven is is more just to bring people chaplains uh, together and resources for the first responders to um, to glean uh, information for so it's so sad right now because we have a lot of suicides within um, the fire department um, and, uh, and and it, it obviously families just their whole schedule you know years and years ago they, they had fire season and then you didn't now we have fire seasons you know year-round and in Santa Barbara County now we have a debris flow that we have to be concerned about. And so these are all pressures on families and things of that sort. So we don't want our first responders to, to become depressed, um, go to despair, you know, use uh, substances to, to cope with it and things of that sort. So uh, that's kind of what Chaplain 24-7 was up to, to bring that support. So I think that's actually, um, I, I wasn't aware that suicides were on the rise with first responders here in our community. Um, is that one of the hardest calls for you to, to handle, is, is a suicide? I mean, what, what, what are the most challenging oh. ones for you to, to respond to? Yeah, well, children, Yeah. for sure. That's, that's the hardest. First responders, yes, because, and I take it more personal. Because you know them. Because I, I not only know them, but I feel like as a, as a chaplain, I should have been aware of it. Many times I'm not aware of somebody's struggles until after it, it happens. 
So in fact, we just had a suicide awareness class uh, about a month and a half ago with the first responders fire. And then um, this week we're doing a three-day class on peer support. So we have peers with peers within the fire service to help them if, if they're dealing with, with personal things or job-wise. So it's all stepped up, much like the military. They've really stepped up for their, for their veterans and their service people. First responders are stepping up. Well, I think it's really important, and, uh, and, and I think, you know, the uh, analogy to the military is really important because I, I think as a community or as a, a culture, we put people in these roles and we have these expectations of how they are supposed to be. And if you're my strong policeman that's going to run in the face of danger and protect me or the firefighter, uh, it's almost like a requirement to put on a facade and I take away the humanity that you this also takes its toll on you and your family. Yes. And I know that firsthand because I had cops in my family. Okay. So I know I know okay. what that what it can be. So true. Yeah. You know what I have found though is is the the, the um, generation difference. The, the the newer law enforcement and firefighters have a different outlook. They're more receptive um, to these programs, opposed to the Vietnam era ones, that my, my era, um, which was, you know, just suck it up. I mean, that's what they would right. say. And so if you see something really tragic and they just say suck it up and there's no help, then those are the things that will be rattling around in your mind, you know, for 20 years. And then this is not uncommon to find first responders in their retirement take their, take their lives. Yeah, you know, uh, when you say that, I am aware of someone who did do that, and I didn't put the two and two together, you know, but it, it, it is, um, you know, when we, ha when we identify so strongly with the role, mm -hmm. uh, it's tough. Well, um, Jerry, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for the service that you offer our community, um, our first responders, and all of us. Um, I hope I never need you, but I'm glad to know that you're there. I appreciate um, that. We have this little book of living love in which you can write the name of someone that you'd like remembered because to live in hearts we leave behind is not to die. And I would like to thank my cast and crew, Elliot Jacobson and Michael Nicholson, Jerry, my guest, and TVSB.